have my undergraduate degree in nutrition from Bassier, and I am currently conducting a university-funded project on vitamin D and athletic performance. So that's been really fun and very instrumental in helping me learn more about how vitamin D uh, affects people. And I also write for the Vitamin D Council's blog. Okay, the sunshine vitamin. <laughs> what is vitamin D? Vitamin D is very unique because unlike any other vitamin, your primary source of exposure is actually through UV radiation. So there are some food sources of vitamin D, but they pale in comparison to the sun as a source. You can get negligible amounts from whole milk and eggs, and actually a decent source from salmon, sardines, other uh, deep water fatty fishes. And most people are surprised to find that cholesterol is the precursor to vitamin D. So when you eat food that contains cholesterol, it goes into the small intestine as oxidized, and then that form migrates up to the outer layers of the skin, and that's where it resides until UV radiation hits it. And once it does that, it initiates a cascade of interactions that allow ultimately vitamin D to be produced. And as I have shown you here, so cholesterol, then that's the oxidized form. This is the pre-vitamin D that's made once the sunlight hits it in the skin. Then it heads on over to the liver. The liver performs the primary activation. And this is actually the storage form. This is what you measure when you get a vitamin D test. When you go to the doctor, you say, I'd like a 25 OHD test. That's what they're measuring, is the storage form. And then ultimately, the 125 version is made by the kidneys. So it migrates from the liver over to the kidneys. It has its final activation. And then this final form can go throughout the body and do all these things. So as we just discuss, uh, discuss, the form that's made by the kidneys is the active form. Now, for a long time, we thought that only the kidneys could make vitamin D. And we thought, oh, well, it's just involved in bone health and it helps you absorb calcium. End of story. Well, in the past 15 years, they started to realize that this enzyme that converts the vitamin D into its final and hormonal form is actually present in almost every tissue in your body. And so that's where all the excitement is coming from, because we're starting to say, wow, it must be important that everyone needs to make it. So you know, why is this spread everywhere, and what's it doing? It has hormonal effects. So that 125 form, once it enters inside the cell, it can go and sit on your DNA and induce transcription and translation of genes that encode for thousands of things. You know, we, we think that about conservatively 10% of the genome is vitamin D dependent. This is at least 2,000 genes. As I stated previously, the classic understanding of vitamin D is its relationship to calcium. We used to think that the one gene that it was important that it encoded for was for calvindin. And basically what calvindin does is when it comes in to the small intestine, it grabs calcium from your gut, pulls it inside, ferries it across, and drops it off in the bloodstream so it can go where it needs to go. This is how you get rickets. If you don't have enough vitamin D, you will not make enough calvindin. If you don't make enough calvindin, then you are not going to absorb your calcium. This can also happen in adults. Osteomalacia is the failure of the bone matrix to remineralize and they'll soften. And you can see some of the same symptoms as you do with crickets in children. And this was actually why we started to fortify milk. Our milk fortification program was the first public health program where we were putting vitamins into food. And that was in response to the rickets that we were seeing. So the cofactors to properly absorb vitamin D are magnesium. Uh, zinc, boron, vitamin A, and vitamin K. Um, magnesium, I like to talk about just because it's so important. It's really one of the most fundamental um, minerals in the body. It's used for hundreds of reactions. That, I mean, every single second that you're doing to make them happen. And it's needed for both activations of vitamin D, the liver and the kidneys. And actually, um, vitamin D, if you start a, a supplementation program or you go out in the sun a lot, if you had a low magnesium status, vitamin D could expose that and you could encounter some magnesium deficiency symptoms. That actually happened to me, um, but that's because I was taking such a high dose that I don't really recommend any of you take. <laughs> but you can encounter muscle cramping. That's the most common symptom. And so I was sitting, you know, at my computer like, why is my calves cramping? You know, I go jogging and I was getting cramps. And it was from taking such a high dose of vitamin D. So it won't cause magnesium depletion, but it can unmask a low magnesium status. Okay, so now here comes the raging debate in the vitamin D community. 
The RDA is set at 600 units a day. Unless you are over 70, they recommend 800. The upper level is 4,000 units a day. However, if you go out in the sun, you will produce anywhere from 10 to 25,000 units in 10 to 20 minutes of sun exposure. Now this, this figure is for light skin people, so most people in this room, that would be true for. The darker your skin is, the longer it's going to, make, it's going to take you to make the same amount of vitamin D. Um, and so with those doses with the RDA, the Institute of Medicine says that a blood level above 20 is going to be sufficient for optimal bone health. But if you were out in the sun, you'd be making considerably more and having a considerably higher blood level. So the newest review article that came out said, challenges the Institute of Medicine and says, we need blood levels above 32 nanograms per milliliter to have optimal bone health. They've come to this conclusion from looking at a wide range of studies and different types of studies. And they're saying, you know what? That 20 is not going to cut it. It needs to be above 32. And also, um, another review article that was talking specifically about cancer said, not only would a blood level of 32 if we could optimize the population to that amount, not only would we see the optimal bone health, we would see probably 50% of colon cancer cases prevented. And if we got everyone's blood levels up to 50 nanograms per milliliter, that would, pre uh, that would prevent about 50% of breast cancer cases. Now, this data has been challenged because a lot of it is observational, meaning that you're looking at the population and you're doing mathematical adjustments to decide what is actually causing uh, the effect here. However, at the seminar I went to in Houston a few weeks ago, they had a man from the uh, Harvard Public School of Health, and he said, you know what? He said a lot, we don't necessarily have those controlled trials, the way we control, like, test drugs. He said, we don't necessarily have that for vitamin D, but he said, we don't have that for a lot of our other public health policies. We do not have randomized controlled trials showing obesity is bad for your health, smoking is bad for your health, you should wear a seatbelt, you know? And he said, and yet, we have very effective public health policy that everyone's on board with. And he said, well, I don't know why if we can't get everyone to look at the same body of evidence and say, you know, 32 is probably, looks like where it's going. Um, they do have a couple randomized controlled trials. The most famous is one that shows that vitamin D and calcium together dramatically reduced um, all cases of cancer, not just the breast and colon, although the breast and colon cancer are the most strongly implicated uh, with vitamin D. What is the pro-vitamin D camp, including Harvard Public School of Health, looking at as their evidence? Well, they have, for the first time ever, a study recently, actually in the last year, showing that Maasai and Hadzabi peoples on the equator have blood levels that are an average of 45 nanograms per milliliter. So that made a huge splash in the vitamin D community, because the IOM is saying 20, as we talked about, you know, and then the average like, blood level in this area, from what I've seen young women, tends to be around 20. So when I uh, test people's blood for the study, they come in at an average of 25. I have someone actually at seven. Mm -hmm. um, and my highest, well, I think she was uh, 32, actually. So she was right there on that cusp of uh, sufficiency, the lower level of sufficiency. And this is such a big deal because these people are living what we consider a natural lifestyle. You know, they're living the way that they assume we evolve, outdoor, sunshine, natural foods, and that's what their blood level is. Um, also, a very interesting physiological little uh, clue is that if your blood levels are above 50, the liver will dramatically slow down how quickly it's processing vitamin D. So if you have a blood level below 50, mm -hmm. you are converting into the, from that storage form into the active form exponentially more rapidly than you are above 50. So it kind of is hinting at, you know, 50 might be what they call, some people call the sweet spot. So the body, body says, all right, got enough. So we can, we can slow down. Um, and as I said, the majority of the vitamin D community supports blood levels of 50 as the normal, an average of 50. So there's some leeway on either side of that. But 40 to 60 is kind of the spectrum that most of them are saying we should strive for. How much should I take? People always want to know that. And so outright deficiency, medically speaking, is defined as less than 20 nanograms per milliliter. So if you go into your doctor, and you have a blood level below 20, they will most likely put you on prescription vitamin D. It's a very high dose of vitamin D. They call that loading the tank. And so they want you to go from you know, 